you know, my aunt had a pretty solid point. If I'm reading this to you, why would you go buy the book? Sorry, let me adjust that for a minute. I have a few reasons. One, I truly want to help people. But she's kind of right in a way, you know, I mean, if I'm reading it to you, why would you buy the book? Well, it's my hope that you'll buy my book. Um, books, I, there's another book on grief. And gift it to someone or just to have a copy for yourself, you know, for those times when you just need to know you're not the only one going through something, you know. So, sorry, my dog's playing in the background. So, while we move on to chapter eight, get you a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is you like to drink. And let's go. Chapter eight is titled Rejection. When we feel rejected, no matter who rejects us, whether it's a job that we are trying to get, a friend or especially a partner or spouse, a parent, a child, it doesn't matter who rejects us, we lose our feeling of self-worth. This type of loss brings down our self-esteem. But one thing that I want you to understand is that no matter who they are, if someone makes you feel like you're not good enough for them, and hear me on this, pay attention to what I'm about to say. The problem is not yours. I'm going to say that again. If someone decides for whatever reason or reasons that you're not good enough for them as you are, just as you are, without having to change a single thing, the problem is theirs. I love the gospel hymn, Just As I Am. Whether you're religious or spiritual or not, this should speak to you. If our creator accepts us, in fact, wills us to come to him just as we are, flaws and all, no matter what your situation is in life, no matter what you've done or not done, in this song, he bids us to come to him. He doesn't ask us to become something different or better before we're good enough for him. We are good enough for him as is. Now, this isn't an altar call. I'm simply trying to point something out to you. If something that many perceive, including myself, as the highest form of being, our creator says, I love you just as you are. I accept you just as you are. Then I ask you, what right does anyone else have? What right does someone with their own imperfections, human frailties, have to ask you, or in some cases demand, that you adhere to their idea of what they think you should be before they can love you? I mean, think about it. Who do they think they are? Look, if someone doesn't love you and accept you as is, don't for one second buy into it. It's a form of control. They are telling you that you have to be this or that or not be this or that before you are good enough for them to love. And it's wrong and you deserve better. Real love, real connections are not something that can just be there one minute and cut the next. And real love, if it's ever there to begin with, should be unconditional. If it's not, why would you want it? You are good enough just as you are. This kind of rejection is never sadder than when it's in families. We've all had those family members or known families that stop talking to one another. Just as a result, children don't get to see parents and grandparents don't get to see grandchildren, and it's a vicious cycle. This behavior is taught. I don't believe it's something born into our hearts. Our hearts were made to love and nurture. I know a young lady who didn't speak to her father for many years. As a result, her daughter wasn't allowed to have a relationship with her grandfather. Inside this little girl was planted a seed, a seed that would turn into resentment, mistrust, anger, and hate. The grandfather passed away, and the issue between father and daughter was never resolved. The father never stopped loving his daughter and never understood why she did this to him. The granddaughter grew up, 
and has children of her own, and you guessed it, that seed grew and reproduced whether she knows it or not. She has planted the same seed within her own offspring. Her children don't really have much to do with her mother or that side of the family. Everyone is being punished, many hurt, some just choose to detach, and some understand it's not their problem, but also know there's nothing they can do to fix it except continue to show unconditional love. But it's up to the granddaughter now to end the cycle, or it will continue with her own children, and someday, unfortunately, if she has a disagreement with her own kids, she may be the one rejected. It's an ugly cycle, and it takes a heart that has enough love in it and enough forgiveness to break that cycle. It's okay, and yes, it is possible to set boundaries and expect others to abide by them, but it can be done in love, and rejection should never be an answer. The innocent ones are always the ones to pay the price. They miss out on being loved. They miss out on special connections and ties that are irreplaceable. They are left with questions, questions that no matter what we tell them, they will always seek out to answer on their own. Chapter 9 Daisy Mother Nature Comes a Calling I was a late bloomer. I was 15 before I got my first period. My mom kept saying she was going to take me to the doctor if I didn't get it by the time I was 16. Both of my sisters got theirs around 11. My mom had a history of leaving our dad, and it so happened that on this particular morning, it was during one of those separations. I woke up during the summer feeling like I had to pee worse than I ever had in my entire life. I went to the bathroom to find my underwear soaked in this brown liquid. I had an idea of what it was, but wasn't altogether sure. Since my mom was gone, I had to wake up my little sister. Not only did this seem wrong, but was embarrassing. I told her what had happened, and she talked to me about pads and such and helped me get my bed cleaned up and myself sorted out. The most embarrassing part was telling my dad. I remember a phone call with my mom. I guess hormones were raging out of control, but I was very upset that she wasn't around to help me in that very important time in a girl's life. We had been waiting and waiting and worrying, and finally when it happened, she was nowhere around. It should have been an exciting time, a happy time, but instead it was a stressful time and deep feelings of rejection were implanted inside me. I remember talking with my mom on the phone and I was yelling and very upset and she said to me, if I were there, I would slap you in the face. I don't know what I said to make her say that, but my response was, well, you're not here, are you? I handed the phone to my dad and walked away. My dad was very understanding and felt I had a right to be upset. Even this did not prompt her to come home. My dad had to hire a sitter, more just someone to be there for us. Well, this woman took me into the bathroom, literally showed me on herself how to insert a tampon. I will never forget it as long as I live. I was humiliated beyond belief. I didn't want her to do that. I didn't want her even knowing, but my dad was at a loss. Who else was supposed to show me? After that, I walked out of the bathroom and told my dad where she could hear me. I want her out of here now. And believe it or not, he asked her to leave. I've never forgotten how I felt that day, and I didn't have a nice story to tell about the first time I became a woman. Instead, I have this traumatic memory, and while I love my mother, this is but one of the seeds of rejection she planted in the garden of my heart. I felt unimportant, worthless, unwanted, and unloved. There's something called abandoned child syndrome. Don't believe me? Look it up. It's what happens to someone mentally and emotionally when they are abandoned over and over, especially as a child. This abandonment can be physical or emotional, such as when a mother withholds affection and nurturing. If a parent physically leaves, it doesn't matter what their reason is or how good the parent believes it is to be or even if they think it's in the child's best interest, it can cause psychological damage. This damage is reversible, but only if the child or adult gets appropriate counseling. Just as I said in a previous chapter, the stuff that happens to us as children must be dealt with in order for us to be healthy adults. 
When a child is abandoned by a parent, it doesn't matter which one, and it doesn't matter whether they left on their own or court ordered. A child knows no difference. They believe it's a reflection of their own value. It is not. As crazy as this sounds, they take this thinking to heart. These wounds go deep and scar, sometimes for life. It impairs their relationships with just about everyone because trust becomes something they stop believing in. Think about it. If the one or one's parents who are supposed to nurture, protect, love them unconditionally, if these people hurt us, then why on earth should we trust anyone else? If these hurts are not healed, it becomes a huge part of who they are as adults, and whether they know it or not, becomes a part of every decision they make, be it good or bad, especially when it comes to relationships, because they are forever seeking acceptance and forgiveness for something they didn't do. They never find it because no one can offer them what they seek, except maybe the one who hurt them, but most of all themselves, and that takes intense work on their emotional and mental selves. So how do you know if someone you love or even yourself is dealing with this issue? Here are a few symptoms to look out for. Alienation, withdrawing from others and social activities. Depression resulting in the belief that the child had anything to do with the abandonment. Being clingy out of fear and uncertainty, having insecurities, sleeping disorders, eating disorders, physical ailments such as fatigue, and grief showing itself as anger. So what can we do if we see these symptoms in ourselves or our child? Seek help and do it as soon as possible. Dealing with these issues as a child gives the individual a much better chance at successfully healing. I'm a grown woman in my middle 40s, and dealing with things that happened to me as a child is one of the reasons I decided to write this second book. My own abandonment issues has played a huge role in the relationship, the relationship, sorry, that I've had, even the BDSM stuff, because it was all about needing to feel worthy, important, and protected. It led me to abandon my first husband because I felt he was emotionally unavailable, so I clung on to the first person who showed me any kind of attention. Eventually, he left me. I probably deserved it. But you see, even saying that I deserved it is wrong. But I have convinced myself that I did. You know what's really messed up is that my own mother's leaving probably had something to do with her father abandoning them. I can't speak for her, and it's certainly not an excuse. But it's what she knew. It's what she was taught. Keep that in mind because you think your decisions affect only you or that they will have little impact on your children. We all like to believe kids are resilient and they bounce back fast. Baloney. It may appear that way, but instead, the pain exists and those scars run deep and eventually surface. Even if we somehow manage to cope while we are young, and we do, don't we? Once we're grown and are more free to make our own decisions, all those hurts play a huge part in the decisions we do make and we, they, do not forget and forgiveness becomes even harder. The truly sad thing is we, the abandoned, find it easier to forgive those who hurt us than we do to forgive ourselves. Questions always nag at us. Did I cause them to leave? Did they love me? Do they love me? Am I a bad person? Why was I not as important or more important than whatever it was they left to seek? And probably the most damaging question of all, will others eventually abandon me too? These questions need answers. Better yet, they need to be put to rest before healing can even begin.